Amen. 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 The book of Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, New Living Translation says this, and they sang a new song with these words. You are worthy. Somebody say, you're worthy. You are worthy. So they sang a new song with these words. You are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals and open it. For you were slaughtered. That's why you're worthy. For you were slaughtered, and your blood has ransomed people for God from every tribe. Somebody say every tribe. Every tribe. From every tribe. It don't make no difference where you come from, what tribe you're in, what clan, what your family name is, what your history, history is, whether you're Irish, Jewish, African, whatever, every and language. So you can speak, speak Swahili, you can speak English, you can speak Spanish, it don't matter. Amen. Amen. And people, no matter what kind of people you are, yes. colored people, uh-huh. white people, yeah. purple people, blue people, as long as you're people. Because as long as you're people, you need to be saying that he is and y'all got that? Well, you may be seated. Hopefully, we're going to have a little fun with this day. I hope you get something out of this. Uh, let me start off by saying a heartfelt thanks to the ministers who've stood in the gap the last three weeks, uh, Minister Adrian Daniels, Minister Ernestine Carswell, and Minister Will Godlib. I want to thank you all from the depths of my heart for being on the striving team. Now, again, as I say, this being the first Sunday of the month, Uh, where we commemorate and celebrate uh, the Lord's Supper, I just want to speak from the thought today, the worthiness of Christ's sacrifice. The worthiness of Christ's sacrifice. Now, worthy means that something is suitable or fit for a specific thing. Now, the second definition, you say worthy is deserving of recognition for what was done. Now, we know that in a great way, Jesus Christ is deserving of the recognition for what he has done. And in a smaller way, and out f- compared to Jesus, each one of those kids were worthy of the recognition that we gave them. And so, therefore, when we look at Christ's sacrifice, the Bible lets us know that because he was worthy... He was the one who could open these seals. Now, in our text, I just want to pull this passage out of Revelation just to show you uh, that Christ was worthy of the sacrifice. In chapter 5 of Revelation, John continues his glimpse into heaven that he began in chapter 4. The scene in chapter 5 shows that only the Lamb, Jesus Christ, is worthy to open the seals which details the events of future history. And John makes it clear that Jesus Christ is in control and he alone is worthy to set into motion the events of the last days of history. He is worthy because he was the lamb that was slain for our redemption. In other words, God used Jesus to buy us back to himself. And so when I read this verse and I look at it, we say the lamb that was slain, emphasizing the significance of Jesus' sacrifice. He was a lamb that was slain without blemish. So therefore, he was a perfect lamb to be the sacrifice for mankind. He was worthy, and it was specified this way because he was suitable for the purpose that God had chosen him for. See, Jesus was worthy because he was, he displayed the ultimate act of love by his willingness to die for humanity while he was, while we were still yet sinners. Jesus showed love to us while we were unworthy of his love, but in spite of our sin, he showed love to us. Therefore, his love made him worthy. Jesus was worthy because of his perfect obedience to to the Father. The Bible lets us know that he humbled himself and became obedient unto God, even unto death. And he did that all because of our sins, not his sins. Christ was worthy to take the scroll because of his sacrifice. And Jesus paid the price for people of every nation, language, and tribe. Now, we're going to look and see some of the things that Christ's worthiness 
does for us as a church and as a body. If you go to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 through 14. This passage lets us know that Christ's sacrifice unites believers. Somebody say unites. Christ's sacrifice breaks down the walls of division between people, uniting us into his body. Somebody say his body. The church in general is Christ's body, and the church specifically striving is also Christ's body, and we're supposed to function as a unified body. We are many members, but God expects us to function as one body. Just like our human body has many parts, but our human body is supposed to function as one body. Hands know what hands do. Feet know what feet do. Ears know what ears do. Eyes know what eyes do. Apart, they can do nothing by themselves, but as a unified body, they can do many things. So therefore, when we look at ourselves as a church, we have to be reminded that Christ died so that we could be a unified body. Here in Ephesians, we're going to, he's talking about how he unified the Jews and the Gentiles. How he unified those who the Jews looked down on and thought that they weren't worthy of the gospel. But because of Jesus' sacrifice, he, it made us worthy. Those of us who weren't born into the Jewish culture, who were not beneficiaries of the law when it was first given of the word of God, but because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, his worthiness made you a, a, a beneficiary of the same promises that God made to Abraham. Are y'all following me so far? Look at this. He says this, and I'm in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 through 14. He says, don't forget that you Gentiles. Somebody say, you Gentiles. Gentiles. Say it like you mean it. Gentiles. And say, that's me. Say, I say, that's me. I want all y'all to say that's me. You need to know. If you're not a Jew, in biblical time, you'd be called a... And the Jews went even further. They didn't just stop at Gentile mode. They called us other names, derogatory names. So he says, don't forget you Gentiles used to be outside, some of the outsiders. That, that means you was outside of the privileged group. There was a group of people who had privileges and benefits that you didn't have, but because you was looked at as an outsider, therefore you was not a beneficiary of what God had for you. But he says now, don't forget that you used to be outsiders. And look what the Jews call you. You were called uncircumcised heathens. So when you see somebody say, you ain't saved, you know the Jews, you're just a heathen. <laughs> Amen. I mean, you're saved now, so you shouldn't be offended. Because say you used to be. But now you got some friends who still are. And you have an obligation to tell them that God has something better for them instead of just living their lives as a... Y'all say it with me. Come on now. No, don't act like y'all scared to say the word. You look, if you don't want to agree with me, just agree with the word. Just say what the word say. And I know that's what's happening in church now. A lot of ministers don't want to use the word. I've seen people kick the Bible and talk about it, post syrup on the Bible, saying we don't really need God's word. But the Bible needs to be in the church. Because this is our manual. It would be like a law, a lawyer throwing away all his law books. Saying, I don't need the law, law books. I'm going to just practice on my own. And that's what a lot of folks are doing. They're still in the church, but they're acting like heathens. Practicing on their, oh, y'all ain't going to help me today. Y'all ain't heathens no more. You just got some heathen friends. <laughs> Amen. And you're here today. So you can be challenged to go and help your heathen friend because they're missing out on some privileges and benefits. Oh, Lord, help me. He said, now, you were called uncircumcised heathen by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision. They thought having their foreskin cut off would make them holy. Getting baptized don't make you. Speaking in tongues don't make you. Learning all the rituals that we go through in church does not make you. Something got to take place on the inside that's going to cause you to be. He said, now, they were proud of their circumcision, even though it only affected their bodies and not their heart. If you come in the church today, at least allow your heart to be changed. Amen. Don't come in here and just look good in body. And then your heart is still jacked up. 
else if your heart is still jacked up? You operating like a... Y'all got me now. I think I am locked into somebody. We're on the same frequency. Now, you know, y'all act like y'all scared to say. You know, you ain't got to be scared to say heathen. You were once a heathen, so that don't mean nothing to you. That's not a derogatory term for you. Amen. Back in the day, it may have been, but now that you're sitting here, heathen don't offend you because you're a saint. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Now, look at this, what it says. And, and what I want you to see is some distinct disadvantages for the heathen. Because verse 12 says, in those days, you were living apart from Christ. That was one disadvantage. You ain't going to get to heaven without Jesus. Amen. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the light. No man comes to the Father but by Y'all agree with that? Yeah. So when, when, when we didn't know him, we were, the living, we were living apart from Christ. Then number two lets us know you were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel. Wow. You know there are a lot of people coming to America now trying to get what? You know when, you don't, when you're not a citizen, you're not eligible for all the rights and benefits of this particular country. And the sad thing is, some of you all are citizens don't even know what you're entitled to. You were born here, immigrated here, and now you got your citizenship. But do you know what you're entitled to because you're a citizen of this country? And if you don't know that, then what happened is you can live below your privileges. Amen. And so therefore, you know, we looked down on civics, civics class when we was coming up through school. It wasn't fun. We didn't want to learn that stuff. But now that you get older, you need to learn how this country is ran and who run it. Because you are what? If you're a citizen, you ought to have a voice. Because at one time, he says, you were excluded from citizenship, from citizenship among the people of Israel. And you did not know the covenant promises that God had made to them. In other words, you didn't know that God made promise to Abraham that you were entitled to all because you had been excluded because of the people looked down on you. Then he says in verse 4, at the next part of this, it says, you lived in this world without God. Now that was before Jesus. I'm assuming now that because you're here on Sunday, you at least got God. Amen. If you don't lie this morning, you done got up and laid your eggs and bread, uh, uh, and bread and toast to the side, the cheese and grits and all that, and you done stopped sipping on your latte. Amen. I'm assuming you know God. I'm assuming you're going to let him take precedence over your breakfast this morning. Because you know, oh Lord, y'all, I'm just meddling with the folks at home for a moment because I know some of them just, uh, you know, ain't paying attention. I got to get them back on course here. <laughs> so he says, you live without God and without hope. You had no expect expectation after death. You thought that just dying was it. You had no expectation that that was something that occurred after you died. And that expectation caused us to try to live in a way so that we would experience the eternity that God had in store for us. All that's a part of his promise. And so he says, you heathens, before Jesus, did not know that. But look at verse 3 when we see this attraction that comes about. In verse 13, it says, look, this. But now, somebody say, but now. But now. I, I want you to see this dramatic contrast here when he says, but now. You have been united. All that stuff I said before don't matter anymore. But now you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now. Somebody say, but now. <laughs> somebody shout, but now. but now. But now you have been brought where? Here. You've been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. Thank you. So if you've been brought near to God, that means you have access to God, and you don't need Pastor Bolden to get to him. You don't need anybody else. Jesus tore down the veil so that you can have access to a holy God. Yeah. And why go to church every Sunday or pause and eat your breakfast and you won't even take advantage of that? Yeah. 
access that you have because you have been brought Don't live like you're still living at a distance when it comes to your relationship with God. Being brought near is all about relationship. You have access so that you can go to him anytime you want to. And that was one of the things that was beneficial, uh, beneficial for us because of Jesus' sacrifice. He says, now, but God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. Now look at this, here's the unification. For Christ himself has brought peace among to us. In other words, he united the Jews and you Gentiles, us, into what? One, you know, it's a shame right now that the church is more divided than it's ever been. All because of political issues and, you know, some church want to embrace the world in such a way so they want to win people. Other churches still believe that the Bible ought to be the standard. And because of that, churches are divided. The word of God has got to be the word of God. Culture cannot drive the word. The word is here to change the not allow the culture to come in and reinvent this word. Amen. Amen. And what is happening now is the culture is so cunning and so crafty that it has gotten into the church and now the church look a lot like the all because we can't unite around Christ and around this word. You know, we think that the word of God has lost its power, so we would rather get up here and pontificate about many other things and never read the scriptures. You didn't come to church to hear world news. You came to church to hear the word of God. So he says, for Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when, when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the walls of hostility that separated us. Jesus came to unite the church, and the church ought to be functioning as a united body and not a disjointed body. Because when the church is disjointed, it makes room for the devil to come in and sow seeds of discord. And then now, why would someone in the world want to join a church that is fighting against its When there's divisions in the body of Christ, why would I want to be a Christian? They can't even agree on the basic things that's in the manual. It's okay if we disagree on some of those fringe things that really has nothing to do with heaven and hell, but there's some things that are so basic and fundamental, we all got to agree on. Amen. Amen. And when we can't find that agreement, the world comes in and so discord in the church and then now the church starts to look more like the world than the body. I wish I could have brought y'all some videos. I didn't want to shock y'all today, but I done found some videos online. And I tell you what, if I didn't have the sound to it and I just looked at it with no sound and just looked at it, I would not have known it was the church. I mean, not because they didn't have robes on and all that. I ain't even mind the strobe lights and all the, f the flame, you know, the glitter and all the production. I ain't had no problem with that. But I had a problem when I saw them dropping it just like they drop it in the world. I wouldn't have mind they just swayed back and forth a little bit. Got a little rhythm. But maybe when they were backing it up. On stage, singing to the Lord. <laughs> and I mean, they were, they were getting down. And if I had not known, because I read the title, said that, that was a church service, I would have thought I had just left, you know, the, the Afro Club on High Street. <laughs> there must be a distinction between the church and the world. And sometimes today we're afraid to make that distinction because we think we're going to turn the world off. It didn't turn you off. You hear? The people that want to find Jesus and want to change going to change. The one that you think going to change just because you drop it like it's hot in church, they're going to want to keep dropping it. 
If property won them, property going to keep them. When you tell them they got to stop dropping it. <laughs> Let me move on. I know that we're going to go over too good right there. I, 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 I just want to find out where your leanings are. Because I know you know some of y'all lean. I just want to know where your leanings are. I know you watch wildly. I just want to know what you're watching. Because if what you're watching don't line up with this, you're watching garbage. I wasn't supposed to meddle today. I was supposed to be nice this first Sunday. Let me look at this. <laughs> go to Romans. Let, go to Romans. Let the Bible talk to you. I don't need to talk. Let the Bible talk. Amen. Amen. Look at this. Now I want to share, you know, a couple passages of Scripture uh, that reveals how we should respond to Christ's words of sacrifice. See, that is a transformation, transformative power in Christ's sacrifice. And we must respond in a practical way. See, in view of all that God has done for us, we must strive to respond in a way that is pleasing to him. Amen. Amen. And, and so let's see what the Apostle Paul said to the church at Rome, who seemed like they may have had some culture issues going on. People getting saved and didn't realize that when they got saved, they voted to change. Amen. Did you realize that when you got saved, you were supposed to? Amen. Say it like you mean it. Amen. Amen. If you didn't change and you're the same person that you were before Jesus, then the chances are you just wasted your time this morning. If you're the same person that you were before Jesus, something should have changed in your life as a result of you coming into a relationship with Jesus Christ. You can't be the same person if you've had that Damascus Road experience with him where you have entered into a relationship. Something got to change. But you can never make that change until you start changing the way you... Because if your thinking line up with the culture, then you're going to continue to live and act like... Oh, Lord, help me. Can I read this for y'all? Didn't the, the choir just get through singing, I give myself away? You know, didn't they just say that I present myself now as a, a living? Living sacrifice. Didn't, didn't y'all just get through singing that? If y'all just got through singing that, this don't offend y'all at all. Amen. This is only going to sting to those folks who want to be a living sacrifice to God. And you know, they want to get up off the altar and go get their body to the world. You said, didn't y'all just say something? I present my body, I give my body, give every, all to you, something like that. Wasn't that in that song? Well, I'm finna read a scripture that say that song got some truth to it. Amen. All right, let me read it then, because y'all don't believe me. Some of y'all, y'all work, making me work hard today. But look at this, Romans 12, 1 and 2. It says, now look, and so dear brothers and sisters, I please, somebody say please. You know, plead is an emotional appeal. Almost to the point where you're just begging folk. Amen. Paul said, now look, he called them brothers and sisters. Then he said, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living. He don't want you dead. Amen. Amen. You don't need to wait till you get 70 years old and want to give your body to the Lord. We need to start reaching out to people while they're young. Amen. While they got life, while they can still do things. He says he wants us to present our body in a, as a living and, what's that next word? Holy. Somebody shout it. Holy. Somebody shout like you ain't scared. Holy. Now, if you can't say holy in God's house, if, you, if that just your lips, <laughs> you know, some Christians, they, they scared to say holy. They, they don't mind when people call them, you just think you're holier than thou. They get scared. I don't think I'm holier than thou, but I do think I'm holy. I ain't trying to be holy in you, but I want to be holy in God's eyes. Holy is not a bad word, church. Amen. Because he said, now look, let them be a living and holy sacrifice. 
the kind that will be acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him, by presenting yourself as a living sacrifice, surrendering all to him. That's what worship is all about. That's one of our responses to the sacrifice that was made to us. We give ourselves in return as a sacrifice to God, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. He said, now this is truly the way to worship. He said, now look, now, he could have stopped right there and most folk would have been all right. But he used the word don't in verse 2 in the New Living Translation. You know, I hear a lot of people, I just don't want to go to church. They, they don't, don't, don't. All they talk about is don't, don't, don't. What the Bible talk about? Don't, don't, don't. So am I supposed to leave this out because you don't like? Am I supposed to not read the next verse because some of y'all friends don't like the word? Am I supposed to compromise God's word all because don't get on your nerves, hurt your feelings? Did you come just for the performance or did you come to get your heart changed to be convicted by the word of God? And there's a difference between because now we come to church just to get the performance but we don't want to feel the conviction that comes from the word of God because we don't want to read it no more because it's not relevant in a lot of us. All because it's word major, don't. Can I read it for y'all? Y'all, like they say, when you're flying or you're in a store, you can't, you're in the airport, you're a captive audience. You can't get out of here now because you'll stand out here. Everybody will see you walking out. <laughs> so you're stuck. Time finish. Hey, Amen. <laughs> you're a captive audience. So I'm going to just read this don't in spite of how you feel. Because I, I feel a little tension coming from something. A little tension. I, I didn't come to church to be talked about don't. I want to be uplifted. Well, if you want to be uplifted, don't live like the world. Amen. Let me read this. Let me read this. Let me read this. <laughs> Verse 2. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. But let God transform you into a new person. By changing the way you, if you think like the world, you're going to act like the world. If you are caught up into the customs and the behaviors of the society that you live in, you're going to act just like that. Sir. That's why he say don't copy. Copy Jesus instead of copying the world. Find out what Jesus would do and bring him into the church. If you bring Jesus in the church and show me where he dropped it like it was hot, then I said, let's drop it like Jesus. Let's wave slide and all that other stuff like Jesus. Let's just take it all off just like I heard one preacher say Jesus is the best stripper he ever met. A preacher said that. Now he was trying to make a point because Jesus you know was stripped of his clothes. But his crowd wasn't thinking about Jesus being stripped of his clothes. His crowd was thinking about going to the club, pole dancing, because the next thing he did, he was. And everybody knew exactly where that was. They were like, yeah, they can't, yeah. Now that's the difference between taking your clothes off for money and getting your clothes beat off of. There is a different comparison there. You can't compare the two. But if you're ignorant and don't know what the Bible says, you have to, yeah, yeah. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. If you bring your stinking worldly thinking in the church, the church is going to look like the stinking world. If you do those things, then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good. God wants the best for you. He ain't trying to take all your rights and privileges just because you got saved. He's just trying to get the sin out of us. Amen. 
Don't sit here and play me. We all had a bank load of sin. You know, somehow our sin bank account was so, so rich, rich in sin. Amen. Some of y'all was cheap, then you ain't have much in the bank. You just had, you know, $10, $15 worth of sin. Some of y'all were ballers. You, you had millions of dollars worth of sin, but you were balling. I mean, you, you were just balling out in your sin. You were just balling. I mean, you thought that was good for you. But the Bible said that was not good. So God wants things that will be good for you, which is good and pleasing. When we were in the world, we were doing some things that was not pleasing. At least I was. I don't know. Y'all may have been in a different world than I was in. But in the world that I lived in before Jesus, we did some things that were not pleasing. Nor were they perfect. It's still not perfect, but perfect is talk about we want to grow into that maturity to be like Jesus. If we stop thinking like the world, then we give the Spirit of God the opportunity to help us to grow, to become more and more like Jesus. That make any sense to anybody? Somebody say, you just got to be transformed. You got to be changed. And this word got to change you. And sometimes when the word changes you, it is not comfortable. You didn't come to church just to be comfortable. When Paul preached and Peter them preached on the day of Pentecost, man, they was telling them folks some things that made them un... But nowadays we want to come to church. Uh, I just didn't feel right in there today the way he said that. That's the Bible. You didn't come to church to be comfortable. You come to church to get convicted on some things. Not every Sunday, but sometimes the word ought to come. Have to remind you who you belong to. Because if you don't realize who you belong to, you'll start going back to the old. So again, tell your friends sometimes. When you go to church and if you leave there and you're always comfortable, chances are nobody got on your street. And the word of God should get on your street every now and then. Those he loves, he do what to them? Amen. Amen. So if God never chastises you, he never correct you, there's a good possibility your relationship with him is not where it's supposed to. You can apply that analogy to your children. How can you say you love your children and you never correct? Go to my last turn. My last turn is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15. As the Apostle Paul was reminding the Corinthian church that Christ died for everyone. We established that in Revelation. He died for everyone. And that as a result of that, when we accept him, we're supposed to be his ambassadors. He wanted them to know that it was essential for them to know that they belong to Christ and that they must see themselves as new creation, a new person in Christ, where the old life is gone and their new life has begun. And our response to this new life and this opportunity to walk in this newness of life is that as a result, when we realize just how much we have changed and just what the Lord has done for us, then now we're supposed to go and convince others that they too can change. That the Lord loved them too. See, in spite of where they are. So we may find people like we were found in the gutter from all walks of life. You know, some having premarital sex, smoking a little herb here and there, drinking too much, stealing, lying, you name it. Some of all did it all. Y'all getting real quiet right now. You in here now, you, you safe. I'm trying to, I'm just talking about Helping you right now. And so now get this. If you did some of that stuff, somebody else still doing it. It didn't stop when you got saved. And so now that you know how good he is and what he's done for you, you have an obligation to let them know that, hey, girl, 
even though you're out there selling your body, Jesus died for you. He loved you enough to die while you were still turning it up and sending it out all the power. Bro, while you was out there being a Chippendale, selling yourself, letting them fill your underwear up. <laughs> Jesus died for you. He died to get you off that pole. Amen. Okay, maybe I was talking about the alcohol, y'all. Oh, yeah, I got that. But the kids ain't talking alcohol no more. They ain't talking alcohol. Alcohol is old news for them. They own some other stuff out there. So we got to let them know that whatever stuff they own, Jesus died for them. And look here, now that you're saved, you need to know what the new stuff is. You better stay current with what's going on out there in that world. You ain't got to live in the street, but you need to know what's going on. Because most of the people that you got to reach, they still live it out there in them. Y'all in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, look at this, verse 15 says, He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Uh-oh. Everyone who received him and got this new life, they will no longer live for themselves. Wow. It's no longer about you, what you want, how you want to do it. You're now living for him to try to serve him and to please him. He says, now instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. So in verse 16 says, so we have stopped evaluating others from our human viewpoint or human point of view. In other words, we'll stop looking at people the way the world look at them. See, the Jews had a misunderstanding of who Jesus was. They was looking for someone that was going to come in and save them from the Romans, going to be this great conqueror. So they was looking for a Messiah based upon what the world would have been looking for. But he was saying here that Christ came in a whole different way. He came riding on a donkey, looking like a servant, willing to sacrifice his life. We got to stop looking at this Bible from the world's point of view. We got to look at God's word from his point of view. Because when you try looking at it from the world's point of view, then you're going to twist it so that it will line up with your worldview. How differently we know him now. Our relationship has changed. Now look at this, verse 17. This means that anyone who belongs, somebody say belong. Didn't, I, didn't we just say I give myself away? To you I did, Wasn't that in that song? Yes, Robin, y'all sung that thing with so much emphasis and passion. Yes, to you I belong. I give myself. Give myself. <laughs> My life is not. <laughs> y'all just got through singing the word. And I'm just reading it to you right now. You were singing truth. Now I'm trying to challenge you. Live what you've been singing. This means that anyone who belonged to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and a new life has been. And look at this, the gift from God. He says, and all of this is a gift from God who brought us back. In other words, he redeemed us to himself through Christ. Now look at this. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. In other words, he didn't buy us back just to buy us back. He bought us, bought us back so that we would serve him and now become ambassadors and go out and tell others, guess what, girl? You can come off the pole. You can stop selling it. You can stop prostituting yourself. You can get off them drugs. Amen. You can stop stealing. You can stop cheating. You can stop doing these things. Hey, look here. He already paid the price for you. You have been bought back. You are living below your privileges. 
You don't know, and because you don't know, you're living your life in a state of ignorance. Ignorance means you just don't have a knowledge of what the promises are and what your privileges are, and now that you belong to Christ. And I want to tell you that, hey, he died while you was messed up. So when people start telling you, well, uh, one day I'm going to get it right then. No, you need to tell them, you're just lying to yourself. The devil ain't going to never let you get it right on your own. You got to come to him while you're still stinking dirty and nasty. Weary, wounded, and broke, like they used to say in the old church. And let him take care of some things. Let him transform the way you're thinking. Because until you give him access to your mind and your heart, you're going to still live the way you were living. So we have to tell people that because if we don't take that message to them, they will still be, de- they will continue to be deceived by the devil because he is a deceiver. And he blinds them from the truth. He said, now look, for God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sin against them. And he gave us, somebody say gave us. That's you. This wonderful message of what? Meaning that, hey, God ain't mad at you no more. God made peace with you when Jesus died. If the issue, you got an issue with God, it's your issue, not his. He's already made it possible for you to come back to him. So therefore, you need to understand, and this gift that you got is free. You don't have to do nothing to get it. People need to know, hey, look here. You're not trying to go and just convict people without giving them an answer that's going to save their lives. So you got to tell them, hey, girl, look here. Where you are, I've been there. The Lord delivered me from that. So therefore, my message to you is that if you trust him, you give yourself to him, he can get you out of that just like he got me out of that. And and because of that's your testimony, whatever your testimony is, wherever he brought you from, that's the best field that you can minister in. I can't go minister to nobody about, you know, how to get off drugs and how to leave the weed alone and all that stuff. Because I wasn't a weed head when I was in the world. Amen. That wasn't my strong suit. So I got to tell you, man, you want to give up the weed, do what you got to do. I ain't got that testimony. I never had a weed issue. Amen. No pill issue, nothing like that. So drugs wasn't my thing. That wasn't me. My testimony how to get you out of that club. How to get you out of that club all night. How to get you out of that strip club. So you ain't out there. That's my testimony. I can get you off. I can, you ain't going to be out there watching no pole dance all night. Then to come sit in your lap. <laughs> Baby, that's my testimony. I can, them get a, I, can get them, I can get them off the pole. I can't get them off the weed. Another trouble, I can get them off the pole. I, I can get the profanity out of their mouth. I can tell them they ain't got to say a curse word every time they make a sentence. I can tell them they can be delivered. The Lord can change your way of speaking if you just turn your life over. I, I can do that because I was a master cursor. Amen. From a little boy, I could make whole sentences in curse words. So therefore, it was part of my vocabulary. It just rolled off my and when I gave that to the Lord it took me three years <laughs> three years I wrote it in my Bible it took me three years to get cursing out of me so if you got a cursing problem I'm your guy <laughs> come see me I'm, a, I'm the testimony you can be delivered you ain't got to use God's name in nothing you ain't got to tell nobody to kiss your donkey you ain't, you ain't, you ain't got to do none of that you ain't got to call no mother nothing See, all those words are still in my, but now I make a conscious decision because of the change that has taken place and my thinking has been transformed. I know now I can talk without saying those. So whatever your issue was and you've been delivered from it, that's your testimony. That's how you reconcile people back to God by telling them how God changed So look, let me read 19 again. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sin against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciling. And look what he says. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his case or his appeal through us. 
In other words, you're God's lawyer. And you're acting as an ambassador here on earth. And when God pleads his case, Charlie, he pleading through you. If you get in the courtroom of life and don't open your mouth, then the case is going to be lost. You get out there in the world and the world, I plead you, then they're going to win whoever they're trying to win to their side. The reason that the world is making so much progress is because the church has stopped pleading. We're no longer pleading with people. We're no longer trying to beg people, hey, you need to give up this because it's killing you. It's taking your life down a tube that you don't want to go in. You need to start pleading. Start begging some people. There's a better life for you. you got better promises and better privileges, but we won't plead with people. We encourage people to do wrong, but we won't encourage them and plead with them to give their life to For Christ, see, you're an ambassador, making his appeal. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead. A simple message, Keisha. You don't even need to go to seminary. You don't even need to go to striving class upstairs for no 10 months. All you got to do is say, God, change me. Now come back to God. Come back to God. That's all you got to tell people, Major. Come back to God. He never left you. All you got to do is look at my life. I was out there doing all this but now I gained my senses and I came back to we make this thing too hard. All you got to leave here with today is go to your friends and tell them, come back. Why do I need to come back to God? That's when you start telling your story of why you came back and how your life has changed because you came. So I'm, I'm empowering all of you to leave out of here and be preachers of the gospel. And all you got to do is proclaim to the world, come back to God. Come back to God. Somebody say, come back to God. That's a simple message. You can't leave it there. A pastor was over my head today. He went, no, come back to God. I didn't even need to use the Hebrew nor the Greek. To say, come back to God. Man, if we leave here, can you imagine what some of our families we like? If we just told our cousins, come back to God. You're living below your prison. You're a citizen of another place. Come back to God. You don't have to go out like that. You can come back to God. The price has already been paid for your sin. Come back to God. He never left you. He never forsake you. But you just need to come back to God. And I believe people's lives could be changed if we just carry that little simple message. Come back to God. Y'all need to go listen to that song again too that, you know, I give myself away. It'll have a new meaning to it when you get that part out. I messed it up, but Robin them sung it good. To you I belong. Yeah. Come on, Robin. Y'all help me with that. We're going to close that. Y'all come and say that little part right there. I like that little part right there, man. Come on, Robin. You and she have, Come on up here. Y'all going to help me with this because I know I messed it up. The people, the people online, are, they'll leave. They'll leave when they hear me saying it. But I want y'all just say, man, that little, that little part right there is a message in itself. My life is not to you. I belong. I give myself. I give myself to you. Can we sing that again one more time? Let's stand to your feet. The choir, Marcus, start it up from the top. Let's go from the top. If we, if we was in the club, what they call it when you play it again? <laughs> to run that back. Run that back. Run that back. It, it, it was so nice, we're going to play a little bit of it twice. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I want to thank y'all for participating with us today because I believe the word of God ought to be live, alive and active in our lives. And I believe it ought to change the way we live and the way we think. Amen.